being a great <laughs> a great help and uh, looking for ways that we can make this program more usable and encourage people to develop their networks nationally. Uh, so how about if I just turn it over to you and then after you're done then um, we can talk about talk with Stephanie. Okay. Thank you, Robin. You're up. Okay. Thanks very much, Robin. It's really good to see that there's so much interest in this topic with so many people participating today. Um, that's really exciting. So um, today I'm going to give you an overview of the basic requirements and eligibility um, for the Intercity Bus Program, and then I will get into some detail uh, about specifically the match provision. There we go. No? Sorry, I'm trying to get this off the screen. It's okay. All right. Um, sorry, a little technical difficulty there. Um, so to start, the basic purpose of the inner city bus program is to recognize the importance of the inner city bus network in providing essential connectivity between rural communities and the rest of the nation. Um, in many instances, the inner city bus system is the only link between a rural area and the next largest city. So residents of rural areas really depend on this type of transportation, and it's really important to maintain it and to improve the linkages to it, and that is why Congress has created this program. This uh, is the paragraph that, that um, sets up the most basic requirement of the program. Um, the important thing here is that every state should be setting aside 15% of its Section 5311 rural funds for inner city purposes unless the inner city needs of that state are already being met. And in order to certify that the needs are being met, um, if the state uh, would like to do that, they have to conduct a process to determine whether that's the case, as well as consult with the intercity bus providers um, that are in the state. And there are many ways to determine whether the inner city bus needs of a state are being adequately met, or whether they need additional connections to inner city service. Um, the consultative process with the intercity bus carriers is really the end of a planning process to determine what the needs are in your state. Um, for example, states might want to start with a planning study of the intercity service and the needs that would assess the demand for any city, intercity services in the state, determine what intercity services already exist, determine what barriers there might be for accessing intercity services from rural areas if there are any, and then look at alternatives for removing the barriers to access and whether those can be funded. Um, and then at that point, once they've done all that, um, they may want to publicize the availability of intercity funding and invite intercity operators and others to apply for the funds with specific project proposals. So that's sort of the, the process in a nutshell. We could get into more detail about that in a separate webinar if there's interest and people can indicate that if they would like to. So just a brief definition of intercity bus service so that, so that we're all on the same page about what that is. Um, intercity bus service is regularly scheduled, open to the general public. It's fixed route service, and it connects two or more urban areas that are not in close proximity. Generally, it has the capacity for transporting baggage, and usually it connects to a larger intercity bus network. And for the purposes of the 15% set aside, Inner city service does not include commuter service, and it does not include air, water, or rail service, although it may connect with those services as well as with the rest of the intercity network. So these are the eligible activities for inner city bus service, um, if you were uh, assuming you're setting aside funding for that purpose. Um, you can do planning and marketing, um, capital investment in facilities, such as shelters and depots operation of service, coordination of activities that make connections between small transit operations and the intercity bus carriers, direct operation of intercity bus service itself, and capital, of course, for vehicles and other equipment that support the service.
uh, eligible subrecipients. Operators of intercity bus service are eligible subrecipients for Section 5311 funding. Um, they also could be treated as contractors rather than subrecipients, and that would be the state's option, which way to do it. But either way, the state must use a merit-based selection process to choose the operator. The merit-based selection process will ensure that the private operator is qualified, will provide eligible service, can comply with federal and state requirements, and that it is the best or only provider available to offer service at a fair and reasonable cost. Feeder services to inner city bus service are also eligible for funding under this program. The operator of the feeder service might or might not be the, the inner city carrier that operates the service that's being fed. And the feeder service does not have to have the same characteristics as the inner city bus service. It could be demand responsive, it could be operated with smaller vehicles, or it could be different in some other way. But it does have to have the connection to the inner city bus service. And it's all right, uh, as I mentioned earlier, if it also provides access to inner city connections with rail or air service, that's fine, as long as the bus connection is also there. So to get into the use of the intercity match provision, um, I, on the slide you see the wording from the circular, but I'm going to try to describe it in English a little bit, <laughs> rather than uh, bureaucratic circular speak. And then I think in the second half of our webinar, Stephanie's going to really give an example that may make it all very much clearer. But basically, the in-kind match provision allows a state to use its inner city funding to fund an extension of an existing intercity route or a feeder service to that route, to put it another way. And then they can use the cost of the original route as the match, which reduces or eliminates the need for the state or the subrecipient to come up with a match. So one way of looking at this is a certain intercity bus, inter bus line might be extended to serve a rural area, and that would be the feeder service to the unsubsidized bus service. The net cost of the extension after fare box recovery would be paid by the grant. But the project includes a longer portion of the line, including the part that was there before that was now being fed, and that part is paid for by the intercity carrier. It's unsubsidized. So the net cost of that part, after Fairbox recovery, is now the match for the extension. Uh, because of the competitive process for the grant-funded extension, it's also possible that the extension would be operated by someone other than the intercity carrier who is operating the main line. Um, that's allowable as long as the intercity carrier agrees to the use of the cost of the unsubsidized segment as the match. So it's important to have the inner city bus carrier has to have bought into the entire uh, project definition. So there are now two methods available for calculating the eligible net cost that can be used as the local match. The first is to use only the capital cost of the unsubsidized service as the match and use the FTA capital cost of contracting guidance to determine the percentage that can be used as match. Under the second method, the private operator directly calculates the net project cost and provides the information to FTA showing exactly how the calculation was made, including what expenses were used and how the fair revenues were calculated that were deducted. So again, we're going to get into some examples um, in the second half of the seminar, so um, of the webinar. So I know that's a lot to digest, but hopefully it'll be clear by the time we're finished. Yeah, Stephanie has some great pictures, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and that's always helps. This is a place where a thousand words really, um, you, you need to condense them into that picture because it really helps understand what we're talking about. Um, I did just want to mention quickly um, about excess or insufficient in-kind match. Uh, excess in-kind match cannot be used to increase the federal share above the actual operating deficit, um, so you're limited to the cost of the project. And if there is not enough in-kind match, then the state or the local agency would need to come up with the rest of the match. So really, it, the math has to kind of work out to make it work. And then finally, I wanted to mention um, the documentation requirements in order to use the match provision. Um, and they're listed here. Um, but just make sure that reasonable calculations are used for, to calculate the cost per mile or the cost per hour. Um, 
you have to decide which method you're using of the two methods that I mentioned to calculate the in-kind match, and you have to provide all the calculations and the supporting information. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, the private operator needs to document the cost of the private service being used for the in-kind match, and needs to agree um, and acknowledge that the private service is part of the project, and therefore it's covered by the labor warranty and other federal requirements that are all involved with federal projects. Um, so now, with that, I will turn it over to Stephanie to get into a little more detail and maybe make the whole thing come out a lot clearer. So for those of you who haven't met Stephanie before, she works for Isaacs and Associates, and they are basically the on-the-ground part of Greyhound, helping uh, put projects together, uh, both with the states and with uh, the local government or the local transit systems. And Stephanie has been doing this kind of work for many years and has been instrumental in helping uh, more than 40 projects get started around the country. Uh, this um, inner city match uh, opportunity is one that has really, you can look on the map and see how in Washington and Oregon and uh, some of the other parts of the country um, in the Midwest, uh, this has really allowed the service to maintain its ability to serve rural customers, and uh, whether it's Jefferson Lines or Greyhound or uh, any of the other uh, regional carriers that are participating in this, it's really um, helped us maintain uh, the, the network out there. And Stephanie is totally knowledgeable, so get your questions together and um, we'll look forward to your comments at the end and so take it away Stephanie. Okay, thank you Robin. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so um, let's talk of you know, I, I think Marianne uh, kind of covered the why we're here and, and what the program's about, but I will give my very, very brief history lesson in a single slide. Um, so, Really, the focus of the presentation is how, of this presentation, is how Greyhound works with rural feeder providers and how we use in-kind match to help expand the service and travel options. And yes, it helps to know how we got here. Um, so 5311F um, is a response to uh, the need to uh, support and revitalize rural inner city service. And the in-kind match program, which was initiated in 2007 as a pilot program and was made permanent under MAP 21, has become a very important element in the success of 5311F. Um, the inner city, you know, even with the reduction of um, service to rural communities, the needs for those communities have not gone away, and particularly those that have lost service with more recent reductions. So um, the in-kind match program is growing as more and more states become knowledgeable and more comfortable with the program. And uh, we're aware of at least 27 states using the program, um, at least 77 routes, and over 500 communities that are being served. So really, this is about creating value. Improved transportation service feeds economic growth to the traveling public, the community served, to the rural operators, and to Greyhound. Um, inner city bus carriers benefit from more passengers in the network. Um, feeder operators benefit from uh, the revenue growth generated by more passengers having the opportunity to access the inner city bus network. And we know that assembling a cash match across an inner city uh, bus route that serves several communities can be more than challenging. So um, the main reason this program is so effective it is, is that it allows those cash-strapped rural communities to access federal funds for inner-city bus service and expand their service to communities without a local cash match. Okay, so what does Greyhound look for in, par in, in our partner? Um, the most important thing is a meaningful connection. And in addition to being a program requirement, it really makes a lot of sense. Um, meaningful connections mean several things. 
A common transfer location means that passengers must be able to reasonably walk from service to service and have a safe, comfortable place to wait for a transfer. No drop-offs on street corners in front of closed locations in sub-zero weather. Uh, we're also looking at connection at times of less than two hours. And uh, we, we go through a very formalized pro uh, process to make sure that the interline relationship is formal, the correct information about schedules and stops gets into the Greyhound ticketing system. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, also, no duplication of service. We, we can't support a service that runs over um, unsubsidized service. So for instance, if we're running unsubsidized service between Dallas and Houston, we can't support a, a subsidy for competing service. Um, we're looking for seven days a week. And, and part of the reason for this is that uh, inner city bus passenger traffic is uh, highest generally on Fridays and Sundays. There's a lot of weekend travel. So uh, we prefer that, um, that our feeder carriers provide seven day a week service. Uh, but we, um, you know, we review all that on a case by case basis. Um, interline ticketing is the ability to purchase a single ticket for your entire trip. And, uh, and I'll talk about that a little more on the next slide. Um, National Bus Traffic Association membership. The NBTA is the clearinghouse that allows transit agencies to engage in seamless ticketing. Uh, NBTA has a sponsored transit carriers category for public and nonprofit agencies, which allows grantees to become a member when sponsored by an inter existing intercity bus company for a one-time fee of $100. The purpose of this is to allow revenue that's collected at the point of sale to be distributed monthly to the operators providing the service. So for instance, if a, um, if a, a feeder carrier sold a ticket uh, in Maine for a passenger who was going, say, from Maine to Alabama somewhere, that passenger may travel on three carriers. Well, how does that revenue get split up so each carrier gets the appropriate amount of revenue? Well, NBTA facilitates that process and acts as the clearinghouse for those funds. Um, FMCSA Operating Authority. Uh, a, uh, an inner city bus passenger is an inner city bus passenger, whether it's on a transit um, bus or on an inner city bus, on a feeder service or an inner city bus. Uh, common carrier authority is required to interline with an intercity, uh, interstate intercity bus carrier. So what does, um, what does Greyhound need to know in order to, to put this together? Well, we need to know what the schedule is, what schedule is being proposed. Does it meet the criteria? Uh, we work with operators and states to ensure that we get good connections. We need to know the grant amount to determine how much match is required and whether or not it's available. And we need to know when the service is going to start. Um, and aside to Greyhound Connect branding, uh, we, the marketing uh, for this we like to use is because uh, we want to make sure that a passenger knows that if they get on uh, a non-Greyhound bus, it has, that they can actually get to the intercity net bus network. So we have a, a marketing package called Greyhound Connect that we offer to our uh, theater service partners. Um, helpful if somebody knows you can get there from here. Okay, so interline ticketing. Um, this is an example of a ticket quote on Greyhound for a service between Kettle Falls and the Dallas, traveling on both Greyhound and Travel Washington's Gold Line service. So this is what the passenger this is what a um, a passenger going to Greyhound.com would see. And I know it may be a little difficult to see on a small screen, but um, it shows the uh, carrier from Kettle Falls to Spokane as being uh, Gold Line Washington, GLW is their carrier code. And uh, after that, it's for uh, GLI, Greyhound from Spokane to the Dell. And um, the importance of interline ticketing is that the passenger will see the service as a single trip. And although it's not necessarily required by FTA, Greyhound sees this as a critical is critical to its definition of a meaningful connection and the use of an in-time match. So so 
A good example of how in-kind match works is the uh, Washington DSP program. Uh, in this case, um, Washington uh, manages the process and contacts Greyhound directly rather than, say, the um, operator contacting us um, and tells us what services it needs for match. Uh, Greyhound requests schedules, grant amounts, contract terms for each route, and then we av validate the availability of match and issue commitment letters to the state. And they're renewed with each contract and revised if necessary. Um, in this case, Greyhound's not subrecipient, but the process is not significantly different when Greyhound's providing match for its own subsidy. And the math is, is exactly the same. So um, here we have a service. Uh, this is a subsidized service between Kettle Falls and Spokane. And uh, although it doesn't show here, that makes uh, 10 either. Ten, stops at 10 intermediate communi communities and connects the transportation hubs at the Spokane Intermodal and the Spokane Airport. So the service connects with specific unsubsidized schedules. In this case, uh, the connecting schedule is between Spokane and the Dallas and route to Portland. Um, okay. And uh, you can see that the subsidized service is uh, up here, and that the red dotted line actually represents um, two Greyhound schedules. It represents schedule 6911 and 6912, which is the round trip between Spokane and the Dales. Okay, so each match calculation is schedule specific. Um, the southbound gold line. Schedule 1 arrives at the Spokane Intermodal at 9.50 a.m. and connects to Greyhound Schedule 6911, leaving Spokane at 11.35. And remember, the, the passenger buying the ticket will see this as a single ticket. Uh, Greyhound Schedule 6912 arrives at Spokane at 4.45 p.m. and connects to the Gold Line northbound, uh, Schedule 4, leaving the Spokane Intermodal at 5.45 p.m. So each of these connections is less than two hours. So um, the numbers are modified and made up so that the calculations are a little easier. But uh, the cost to operate the connecting miles determines the amount of the available match. So uh, the mileage between Spokane and the Dales is, uh, say, 264 miles each way. And uh, current guidelines allow the use of 50% of the cost of the unsubsidized service, as Marianne was talking about. We use method one, which is um, the capital cost of contracting guidelines. If the cost of each mile is approximately $4 per mile, the value of the connecting miles is $4 times 50% times 264 miles. We have a round trip, so multiply times two. 365 days a year, we have enough to match a grant, enough uh, match for a grant amount of $385,000 in change. So as I said, uh, Greyhound uses method one and uh, to calculate its in-kind match. All right, so yes, these numbers are made up for illustration purposes. But what if uh, the net project cost for the service is $350,000. Well, that would mean that the operating expense from Spokane to Kettle Falls before the in-kind match is $500,000, uh, less a fare box revenue of $150,000, which means that the net project cost on the subsidy portion of this service is $350,000. Well, this project goes all the way from Spokane to the Dale, so we can add the the cost of the connecting service between Spokane and the Dale, uh, 350. And we know we have $385,000 in change available, but we can only use the amount we actually need. So uh, the net project cost then becomes $700,000. And the grant amount, which is 50% of the net project cost, including the in-kind match, is $350,000 
conveniently the same amount as the net project cost of the um, subsidized service. So uh, I think we get on to questions. Um, Next. So, I'm so back to um, it like we, yeah. So it looks like we've had some questions. Um, Neil, can you read the question? Um, sure. <clears throat> okay, we have one. It says, uh, if 15% of the annual apportionment is expended, then there is no consultation process. It's necessary. Correct. Yes. If, uh, in other words, you're intending to um, to use your entire amount uh, for intercity bus service, then you don't need to certify that your needs are met because you're going to use it for intercity bus service. But you you do need to um, have a competitive process to um, select the operator for that service. Does that answer the question? Um, Right. So you, yeah. if you're not going to, not going to, if you're not going to um, use the money for something else, you're not going to use it for something else. Then, then you, you don't, don't need to. There's no consultation required. In, but right. I, I think it's always good to think about making, um, keeping in touch with the operators that are out there. One of the things uh, when I was working with intercity program that I realized is there was a lot of private operators out there running service, and if they all went away tomorrow. Um, I wouldn't be able to replace them with my 5311F allocation. So trying to figure out what's going on with the private operators and the services in your state um, and the operators that are in your community, it's a really great relationship because, you know, whether you use them a lot or your um, customers are using them, they're a resource and to replace them is just infinitely more expensive and more difficult than working with them to help their um, pro their programs and their businesses be a success. Okay. 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 Next. Another uh, attendee asks um, to uh, please define a commuter service that is not covered. Well, I I think this is Marianne. I, a commuter service would be um, a service that is uh, primarily operated for purposes of taking people to work. So. Um, it, rather than a long haul intercity type bus service, so it could be a service um, that is. Uh, it, it's not. It may not be right. It, it might not be connecting. It probably wouldn't be connecting to the larger intercity bus network. Um, it might be operating at um, uh, you know at peak hours in one direction, going into a city, in another direction, coming out of a city. Um, you know, it would be your traditional commuter bus service. I think um, most transit agencies would know that if they were, um, you know, if they were operating a commuter bus service. I think one of the things to think about in rural areas is when you're looking at trying to create that connection between communities, sometimes you have, there is that need to have that employment connection. The fact that people are able to use the inner city bus to access employment in another community does not make that necessarily commuter bus. What makes it intercity is the very intentional connectivity with the intercity network and the relationship of the um, schedule to that intercity network. So that it's not that you can't have people who are commuting on that vehicle, especially in rural areas, but that you're focusing the development of the service on the connectivity between the communities with the intercity bus and other intercity carriers. And another difference um, might be that, in general, I would say a lot of commuter services are probably only operating five days a week. And as Stephanie mentioned, that isn't really what the bus, an intercity bus network is is going to be operating, um, certainly on on weekends, and you know, most likely seven days a week. Okay, um, we have a follow-up question to a previous question, and it says the last question, however. Doesn't a state still have to have the obligation to conduct an assessment every three years? Um, well, it's yes. a good practice, certainly. I don't, 
off the top of my head, I don't remember if that's in the rule or not. I can look that up, but um, uh, it is always a good practice to um, do your planning, you know, and, and know what's going on in your state, at least, you know, and assess, make an assessment as to the, the need for intercity service. Right. The, the, if part of the intercity assessment can happen through your coordinated human service and transportation planning program, especially in rural communities where you're looking at what are the needed connections uh, between rural communities for access. And uh, that those plans are, I think they're required to be updated every four years, uh, but the intercity, uh, that if you really integrate the intercity question into that pro program um, from the, from the um, local perspective, you could roll that into and provide the good information to the state planning process when they're real, really assessing um, connectivity needs. Okay. Well, another uh, attendee asks, under what conditions may a service connect to Amtrak or an airport and be considered eligible intercity bus service? If it is also connecting to uh, an, an, the intercity bus network. So if the uh, intercity bus uh, stop is in the same place, which I think happens a lot all over the country, is near the Amtrak station, then that's fine. Then you you know your same service might be connecting with the inner city bus stop, and then people might be also riding it and might happen to get on the train. As long as there is a connection to the inner city bus network, then it's fine. It doesn't you know, and it's helpful if you know if the other connections are there also. It's not won't be disqualified. I guess is a way to put it. Okay, another question. Any issues accounting for or getting approval for unsubsidized miles across state lines? Is it based on the approved route? We never have an issue with that. And, and, we, and our subsidized, unsubsidized connecting miles generally do run across state lines. Okay. Um, and there's a series of questions. Um, which states have certified their needs have certified their needs have been met. And then talking about yeah. cities not in close proximity, how is that quantified? And please clarify about the potential to use demand response as a feeder route. Heard once that it was allowed, but I believe that it was indicated for the indicated that for Greyhound's purposes it was not allowed. And it's allowed from a. Uh, it's allowed as part of, um, you know, under the federal rule. It is allowed. I can. This is Mariana speaking for the federal rule. If Greyhound is saying, I'll let Stephanie speak. Yeah. For um, well, well with, with respect to demand response service, in order for us to offer an in-kind match, we have to really be able to quote the service that we are um, matching, and uh, since. We, ha we don't have the ability to put demand response service into our ticketing system. We can't ticket it. Then we cannot offer an in-kind match for it. That doesn't make it ineligible for 5311F funding. It just means that we can't offer an in-kind match for that service. So you could ha find the match from some other source and still do it if you, uh, in a particular state, if that was the feeling that that's what was needed but you would just have to find a different way to match it. Okay, and then there's a follow-up. It says, if demand response is allowed to perform as a feeder, what impact would that have with private taxi carriers? Uh, that's not enough information to answer the question. I, I can't answer that. I don't know. Okay. I think okay. that, that's a very specific question, so I think you're looking for some very specific technical assistance there, and um, better to, uh, if you need an answer from FTA, I would suggest asking it through your regional office. I mean, the, the question about taxis and demand response service is one that comes up again and again, and one of the things about the differences between taxi and demand response is that uh, you are not, um, 
but you are at, you're requesting a ride, but the demand response service is uh, scheduled by a dispatcher, and you can have other people on that trip whether you are interested or not. Um, and demand response service is open to the public, whereas a taxi trip is not. Um, oftentimes, you have taxi operators that are very concerned about demand response service in their community, but really it's a spectrum of services, and uh, demand response transit has not been uh, a real detriment to taxi service in rural communities. Okay, got another question. Does this program qualify for a public transit agency doing this in connection with a private bus company? Um, yes. I think so. Yes. yes. <laughs> if, if the, it's, it's up to the state to make the funding available, and however, whatever subrecipients come forth, that's how it works. Okay. Um, got another question? Megabus and Bolt bus are confusing as examples of inner city bus service as they do not make connections. Passengers can make their own connections and can go between large city pairs that might be closer together and therefore similar to commuter service. Just a comment. Um, well, that's true, and you have the, some of the same issues if you go between rail and bus. Um, we're starting to get Google Transit so that bus services that are on Google Transit are able to make intentional connections or you're able as a customer to create the connections between your um, bus trip and your other mode. I mean, just as if you, just as when you take an airplane, you don't usually get your taxi or um, shuttle at the same moment. You're not scheduling those at the same time door to door. Uh, we, I think over the last five years, we've seen a lot of improvements in access to uh, a variety of modes online, and so the ability for someone who's trying to put together an itinerary to put your intercity legs together and then uh, connect that last mile at both your origin and your destination. So um, I, I would say that we haven't created the visual um, and ac access network that we dream of, but we're working that direction. Okay, another uh, attendee asks, where can we find a map slash data about Greyhound subsidized service routes? Wow. Well, any of Greyhound's routes are, un any of their their services are unsubsidized. Are you trying, the question is whether you're trying to find out where they're partnering or are you looking at what the opportunity is in your state to partner with Greyhound? Those are two really different um, opportunities. Uh, Stephanie? Um, I, could you repeat the question, please? I'm, I'm not sure I, I heard it correctly. They asked, uh, uh, where, where can we find a map slash data about Greyhound's subsidized service routes? Subsidized service routes. Oh. Um, I, I don't. Or are they looking for what unsubsidized services available? I, I, I need to know the purpose of the question, really. Okay. What, what you... I'll go to the next one. Okay. Um, they ask, I see Caltrans uses Amtrak throughway buses and is combined with train ticket into one ticket. Can we do a combination of Greyhound with Amtrak tickets in other states? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. um. They do in in Oregon. Um, you can buy the the feeder service bus ticket and the um, throughway service tickets. You know the train tickets in one place, but it's not a national program that I know of. Uh, and so, the California system, and maybe Stephanie can speak to this, is very. It's a sort of a segregated system. So those buses are on the Amtrak network, they're not in any other network, and those are rail buses solely. Yeah, I'm, I'm really not prepared to speak to that today, so um, I may have to defer that and, and get back to someone later. Okay, well, another question. Um, could you please elaborate on a rural fixed route, fixed route provider that tweaks its route to intersect a bus stop utilized by an inner city provider 
When would it be appropriate to fund that route or a portion of it with 5311F funds instead of 5311? Well, I, I think if the, the feeder service was able to um, provide that connectivity, um, if, if they were interested, the in-time match is not available under 5311, only under 5311F. So if you wanted to or needed to put a service together that uh, needed an in or required an in-kind match, then it would be appropriate to put together a feeder service route that connected with Greyhound service under 5311F. Does that answer the question? Um, I think so. Okay. Okay, uh, this is uh, another question. Um, what can SDA do to allow the availability to provide available funding for an inner city bus service to Amtrak? As our state becomes more rail-centric, we have a tough time approaching inner-city carriers. Um, that is, uh, the, all of the uh, requirements and eligibilities that I mentioned, this is Marianne at FTA, um, are statutory requirements. So the FTA doesn't really have the ability to change uh, the, the eligibility, and right now, um, Intercity Rail is not eligible, according you know, as stated by Congress. So that's not something we can change. Okay. Uh, another question: FDA previously provided an annual list of states that certified there were no unmet intercity bus needs in their state. That report has not been produced for several years. What is the possibility of FDA again reporting this information? I'll have to look into that. I have, I'm new to FTA. I wasn't familiar with that report. I'll, I'll find out. Okay. Another question. If a route only receives capital subsidy, are the operating costs of that route eligible to be used as an in-kind match? In-kind match is strictly for operating. Right. You can't match capital with in-kind miles. Miriam, I'm getting that correct, correct? Yes, that makes Thank sense you. to me. I, I, can you read the question again? I think I missed it. <laughs> yes. If the route only receives capital <laughs> subsidy, are the operating costs of that route eligible to be used as in-kind match? No. No, I would say no. No. Okay. All right. Well, uh, here's another one. What happens to the 15% states must set aside if they do not expend all of these funds on inner city needs? Assuming, of course, that they have not certified their their, their needs are are met. Are these funds held, rolled over, or lost? They can be used if if there is a if there has been a certification. They followed the process, and there definitely are no un met intercity needs, then those funds just uh, go into the regular uh, Section 5311 program for that state and can be used by the state for any other 5311 eligible purposes. Okay, uh, here's sort of a long question with a long comment. Will FTA be making publicly available the amounts of the unobligated funds from each fiscal year? This was something that was done in the past and has fallen off in recent years. To answer a portion of the Amtrak question, inner city buses cannot sell or provide ticketing into Amtrak systems at this time, but Amtrak can provide through ticketing onto inner city bus providers and also operates their own buses that are secured through contracting with charter bus providers. Thank you. <laughs> Great. <laughs> And it was, oh, the first part was about the report. Again, on all of these questions about reports, I will need to check into that. And we can take that up later. One of the things that we've been talking about, I'm really, um, if Stephanie and um, Marianne, could you say if someone were interested in beginning this odyssey of developing a route, an intercity route or intercity connection, what would be the first step that you'd want people to do to take uh, if they were doing this? Um, is I, I would want them to call us, actually. 
<laughs> Tell us what you would like to do, and, and we will see how we can work. We actually do have someone um, responsible for putting together um, theater services across the country. It's uh, Steve Abernathy, and um, and his job is to work with theater carriers and see if we can't develop, help them develop um, projects. But if there's a state that's interested in talking with us about how we can work with them, I'm very happy to talk to someone. And I would say that the first step um, is uh, to understand, you know, make sure that you understand the market and the needs in your state, what parts of your state need to be connected with the intercity um, system, and that you've done, you know, your homework as far as um, knowing that there's, a, you know, a need and a potential route. And then at that point, yeah, you need to not only contact um, you know, contact, I would say, again, make sure you've done your consultation process and that you're conducting a, a um, competitive selection process when you think about um, starting a new just, That's always a good idea. Just to clarify uh, the previous question, it says, uh, what happens to the 15% states must set aside if they do not expend all of these funds on inner city needs? I think there was a misunderstanding. Um, so if you haven't certified but you don't use it, what happens? To if you it? haven't certified and you don't use it, then um, I mean, like any funds that you don't use, if, if they eventually lapse, they'll be the, they'll be gone. Three years plus one. Three year, you have three years. Yeah, three years plus no, two years plus one. I think a, to, a total of three years um, to use any funds that are allocated from FTA. So um, if they're not used within that time period, then they will be taken away. Okay. Another one asks, uh, does anyone use cost per mile to determine eligible cost? Greyhound does. Okay. Then uh, another question, is there any rural BRT that qualifies for inner city bus funding? Oh, BRT. I'm not familiar with any rural BRTs. <laughs> Um, but uh, one of the um, people on the uh, webinar brought up the there's a map that has been put together by the American let's see American Intercity Bus Riders Association ABRA and um, it's at uh, it's online and it shows you all of the intercity bus services Greyhound. Uh, it also shows the you know, the um, rail network. Uh, it has a separate map that has uh, airporters, uh, and so it's a great uh, resource if you're trying to figure out what your uh, intercity network looks like now. That's a great place to start uh, and see what. Uh, is actually out there you might not know about. It's amazing uh, how all these little um, services really do connect and when you look at the map of the U.S. Uh, they are uh, pretty significant. Okay, I have a comment here that says that uh, Velocir RFTA in Aspen, Colorado is the first rural BRT. Oh, well if it connects with the intercity bus network, then it could potentially qualify for intercity bus funding, right. I would say. I don't know if it does or not. Okay, question. What if we have unmet needs but no providers in the area? Can we still certify that the state's needs are met? I would say no, because if you have unmet needs, you don't want to certify that you don't. Um, uh, that would be um, a challenge to meet needs with without any operators, but um, it would be a project worth pursuing. I mean, that the point of having the intercity program that FTA yeah. has is to have a process that identifies or finds, uncovers those unmet needs, uh, and gives 
you resources to address those. And I think through the private partnerships, uh, the fact that you're in a rural community that isn't willing or able um, oftentimes to find extra resources to help people connect long distances because that's very expensive. By working with the private sector, you can uh, get these started. Uh, the example that Stephanie gave of the Washington State DOT program, uh, the, that service was uh, not, not one of the original services that came out of the original uh, implementation of the in-kind match program in Washington State but was uh, possible because through working with the in-kind match program, uh, intercity funds, you built up goodwill, you built up connectivity, you got, you used less of the 5311F resource, and those grant funds were rolled into the gold line to help start that. And that was the ultimate goal of starting the match program was to basically support existing services and build those connections that are really needed in rural areas. And so that, that really was the impetus for me uh, trying to get that started initially. OK. Um, it was a, someone's asking you about a map. Um, they want to know the online address of those inner city maps. Okay. Um, let's see if we can. Um, it's kfhgroup.com slash a-i-r-b-r-a slash home dot html. Um, let's see if we can hold that. If I can interject, this is Jerry. Um, we will be making the call notes available after the call. And that's something that we can certainly put on National RTAP's website with the other materials. And also, Jerry, there's a number of questions asking about um, the presentations. Will they be available for download, PDFs, or PowerPoint? Um, the presentation recording should be available. Um, the individual presentations are generally available. Um, I'll talk to each of the presenters, and we should be able to post them. Mm -hmm. um, also, once the presentation or the recording is posted, that'll be both on the National RTAP website, and it'll be announced in our e-news. Um, so it's something that should be um, easy to find publicly. OK, and I think the last question we have is, uh, what is the possibility of having a future webinar focus on the required inner city bus analysis required by law and the subsequent consultation process with existing intercity bus companies? Future. You want to repeat that, Neil? <laughs> I think that was okay. Good. What is the possibility of having a future webinar focus on the required intercity bus analysis that's required by law and the subsequent consultation process with existing intercity bus companies. That is a great webinar, and I think both Stephanie and Marianne would love to come back for repeat performance uh, and talk about how that works from both the public side and the private side. Um, I also do want to put in a plug for the, R the National RTAP uh, technical Assistance Conference is coming up in Denver, and we're going to have uh, Fred Prevel, uh, some of the people who work at Greyhound, we'll have other intercity operators there um, to sit down with you. If you have ideas about sessions, you, you know, routes that you think might be possible, um, if you have ideas about working with the Intercity Match program, uh, please, you know, think about coming on Tuesday and there uh, will be people there to talk with you and uh, look at your individual um, situation and get some real feedback on that. And we really want to encourage people um, to participate in this discussion because I think uh, access is service, but it's also information. It's how do you get the information out about how your services are used. I saw today that we had some great questions about interlining and ticketing and itinerary building uh, and integrating modes. And I think those are things where our voices 
there are some steps that are being taken in that direction, but our interest and our voices in those areas are key to moving. Um, we have a Google Flex spec now that's creating the opportunity to make demand response visible in trip planners. Well, what does that do for intercity program when we can see those rural connectors that are only available during certain times, but understand that those can connect? So I think the maps and the work that we're all doing, we're uh, creating and actually uh, reflecting back a really wonderful picture of the connectivity that is possible and also is happening out here. Excellent. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, at this point, our call is about an hour. Um, unless our panelists have anything further to add, I think we're ready to wrap up. And like I said, we'll post the notes. Um, we'll post additional materials like that website link. And if people have you know, further questions, I have my own contact information up on the last slide. Please feel free to reach out to me, and I'll try and either find an answer or connect you with the appropriate person. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, right. Stephanie. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.